Well, hello, and welcome back to the Showing Up to Life podcast and YouTube channel. If you even remember what that is, it's been so long. Oh my gosh, folks. My gosh, my goodness. Oh, I miss you. I hope you know that. I really do. I mean, of course, when I say I miss you, what I really mean is that I miss connecting with you on this platform. And and I miss, you know, sitting here and providing information that I know is going to help you and to and, and information that's going to lead to a sense of well-being or a level of well-being, a level of healing and a level of, of, of skillfulness that will help you to live through, you know, to make it through the difficult times of this life. So I'm just really, really so happy to be back here with you. Um, <clears throat> I could uh, I could go on and on about everything that's going on, <laughs> but um, but suffice it to say that things have been kind of busy. We've got a lot of really exciting things going on in the Art Burns coaching world, um, but we got also some pretty uh, t- uh, tumultuous things going on in the Art Burns world as well. So uh, so please, I, I appreciate your patience and I appreciate your um, your your the generosity of your of your patience. So thank you very much. So what I want to talk to you about today is one of the greatest skills, or actually two of the greatest skills that we can possibly develop. And 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 these skills are are again <clears throat> almost everything that I talk about here in the Showing Up to Life podcast and everything else that I do is, is all centered around you know, handling the difficult moments of life, right? Because anybody can manage the, the, the times that are easy and the times that are things are flowing well and, and everything's cool and we're feeling good and no drama in our life, no conflict. That's the easy part, right? Anybody can get through that stuff, right? But it's when life throws the curveball. It's when life squeezes us and, you know, applies pressure to us. That's when we need the skillfulness, right? Because in those moments that we feel squeezed, that we feel pressured, that we feel surprised by life in the in the various curveballs that it might throw at us, things that arise without notice, right? Without any indication, <clears throat> this is when we need the skillfulness so that we can manage our way through these things without completely, you know, not it's not just about not reacting to things, right? Although it is about not reacting to things, <clears throat> pardon me, but the idea is that it's not the the reactivity itself that's the problem. It's what happens when we react, right? When we sort of lose our cool, if you will, and when we find ourselves in a state of, you know, of tension and stress and, and anxiety and <clears throat> perhaps even depression or or whatever else might be, you know, might be your response to this difficult moment. The problem is that those very responses, the stress, the anxiety, the tension, those create more issues, right? They create more stress. They create more, you know, we make poor decisions in those moments. We we say something we can't unsay. We, we you know, choose one thing over another without thinking it through. And then we wind up with more curveballs, right? We wind up with more pressure and more tension. And then that becomes the feedback loop, right? <clears throat> and this is where we can find ourselves for years in a state of, of this, you know, stress tension cycle. And so that's what these, that's what these practices are really about, right? Is, is to, is to manage those moments where life is, is applying that pressure and to still be able to, to stay within our center and to, and to still make positive decisions that are going to not cause negative you know, outcomes, even though it seems like the thing to do at this time, right? Which is to say we can we can remain critical in our thinking. We can remain at least partially, at least somewhat regulated in our in our responses. And as a result, we we live a life that is that is wise. We we're making wise decisions and we're walking a path of wisdom through our lives. And so <clears throat> to me, the two most important aspects of this, the two most important skills that we can develop for this are the skills to be to meet every moment, every experience in our lives with curiosity and also gratitude. 
Okay, these are the most important skills that we can have. And, and when I say the skill, what I mean is, you know, of course, curiosity is not necessarily a skill in and of itself, right? It's, it's, it's a sort of attitude. It's a sort of, um, you know, an intention, if you will. And the same thing is true with gratitude. However, the skillfulness is, is in the ability to meet each moment, each experience, and especially, again, those experiences that are difficult for us. That's when, that's the skillfulness of curiosity and gratitude that, that I'm talking about, which is, again, to say, you know, even in the most difficult situations, right, to ask ourselves, okay, what can I learn from this? How can this help me to grow? How can this help me to understand someone else? How can this help me to, you know, what can I get from this experience, even though it's very negative? Of course, we can do this with the positive experiences as well, and that's kind of the trick, right? You do it, you know, moment by moment, no matter what's going on, and then it just becomes the equanimity, right, that you just meet every moment with curiosity, and then again, also with gratitude, now, <clears throat> gratitude is tricky in this sense, right? Because, you know, when things happen that are negative, right, we're not saying that, or or at least I don't think, I, I know I'm not saying, and I hope nobody else is telling you, that you should be grateful for difficulties, right? Although, I mean, that is kind of what we're saying. <laughs> we're not saying that we're, we're grateful for social injustice, for instance. We're not grateful for seeing children that are starving. We're not grateful for, you know, somebody hurting us, okay? Like, it's not that you have to be, you know, thankful for the act of somebody hurting you, okay? But when we say gratitude for every experience, just like we say curiosity for every experience, what we really mean is gratitude for the opportunity that life is presenting to us, right? Which ties in with the curiosity, right? So, so what can I learn from this, even though it's something really, really hard and really even devastating, right? If I'm looking at it with curiosity and I say, well, what can I learn from this? How can this experience help me to heal and to grow and to become more aware of myself or, or any of, you know, the, the possibilities are practically infinite, right? <clears throat> and in that moment, we can be grateful for that opportunity, right? We can be grateful for the fact that this is helping me in some way, even though it's a terrible experience that I'm having, even though it might hurt a lot, I mean, even though it might cause a, a really difficult emotional experience. But I can be grateful for the opportunity for the growth and the healing and the learning and the connection that, this, that whatever experience might provide. Now, here's how this all works, and this is why it's so important to, to practice, okay? Because as I said before, anyone can do this when things are going well, <laughs> right? All we got to do is remind ourselves, you know, yeah, be curious, be grateful, you know, it's easy enough. We could put some post-it notes, we could set a little reminder on our phone, and, and, and when things are going well, you know, again, we're driving along in our car, there's no traffic, the sun's shining, everything is beautiful, and yeah, I can be really grateful for this, and I can be curious, I can do all that stuff, sure. But what about the time where I'm running late for a really important meeting and it's raining on the road and it's really like white knuckle driving and then there's an accident and I get stuck in traffic? In that moment, I don't have access to that, you know, that sort of peaceful and intentional area of my brain in order to access that that curiosity and that gratitude. This is why we must practice it. Now, I recently heard somebody talking about this, and I'm going to borrow what he was saying a little bit here, <clears throat> although I'm going to just do this really quickly just to give you a, one way of, of illustrating this, and then I'm going to go into my way of illustrating this. But, but I thought this was really interesting. So this guy was holding an orange, right? He says, if I squeeze this orange orange juice is going to come out, right? Everybody in the audience, yeah, right, of course, it's an orange, you know? He says, I could squeeze 10,000 oranges just like this one, and I'm never going to get apple juice out of it, right? Of course. And he says, why is that? And that is because there's orange juice inside this orange. There is no apple juice inside this orange. So when I squeeze it, the only thing that can come out is what is already inside of it, okay? Now, we can take that a little further, this wonderful speaker was saying, and we can say that when life squeezes us, 
right? Like, let's say somebody, you know, cuts us off on the road and, or somebody says something that's rude to us or somebody, you know, we see somebody behaving in such a way that, that, that triggers us somehow, right? It upsets us somehow, right? Well, <clears throat> in that moment, we, we, we react, we respond, or actually it is more of a reaction <laughs> than a response, but, but we, we respond with, you know, maybe anger, maybe tension, maybe stress, maybe, you know, resentment, maybe vengefulness. And we say <laughs> that I'm responding the way I am because of the thing that the person did and because of the way they did it or the way they said it or what they did, what they said, how, what have you. That's why I'm um, angry. That's why I'm, you know, vindictive. That's why I'm, you know, resentful. That's why I'm spiteful. That's why I'm tense and stressed right now because of what that person said or did. But the truth is, and I can t attest to this 100% from a personal standpoint, and I also have a, a long list of clients who can attest to this as well, right? The truth is that it has nothing to do with what the person did. I mean, yes, it does. That's the trigger, right? That Whatever that action was is the trigger that brought out the thing, right? Whether it's anxiety, stress, anger, what have you, <clears throat> But the reason the anger is there and the reason the resentment is there and the reason the spite or the or whatever it is, the stress, whatever it is, has nothing to do with the action of the person. Anything past that triggering is what's inside of us. Okay, which is to say that if we are filled with stress and with anxiety and with anger and with spitefulness and with, with reactivity, well, then that is what, just like an orange, when life squeezes us, that is what's going to come out, right? Now, I choose to, to explain this more on a, you know, a neurological sort of neuroanatomical uh, basis, okay? As you all know, I'm a big fan of neuroscience, right? And and so, so what's what's happening there is that you know, as as you all know, or I've said before, uh, perhaps you've heard me, perhaps you haven't. Um, th there's different regions of our brain that do very, very different things, right? Now, there's a, a a bilateral division between the left brain and the right brain, and we all, you know, most people know that the you know the right brain is the sort of emotions and the the connectivity to everything, and the sort of I like to call it the hippie of my brain, right? Whereas the left brain is like the professor of my brain, right? It's all about logic and linear thinking and language and Loves the fact that I'm using L for all these <laughs> labels, right? <laughs> um, but but there's also a top-down division, right? And and so when we look at the brain, right, the top part of the brain is the part of the brain where we function executively, which is to say that's where our intention is. That's where our um, curiosity is. That's where our gratitude is. That's where our compassion is. This is where we get things done. This is where we figure stuff out. And like I said, when you're driving along in your car and everything's sunny and traffic's moving and you got plenty of time to get where you're going, that's the part of your brain where you're dwelling and you're, you know, maybe listening to the lyrics of the song and making connections and having beautiful thoughts come into your mind. Oh my gosh, it's wonderful up there in that neighborhood, right? But when we become triggered... Okay, when life squeezes us, all the energy, or not all, but, but the predominantly the energy goes down into what, you know, Daniel Goleman, the author of the uh, Emotional Intelligence and Social Intelligence, books I have right here on my desk, um, you know, he calls it the low road of the brain, right? So we have the high road, whereas where all that executive functioning is, and then we have the low road, which is basically our survival space, right? That is what they call the limbic area, and it's also called the mammalian brain, which means that every mammal on earth, your dog and your cat or the chipmunk that you saw in the backyard this morning, all have this same apparatus of, of this limbic area of the brain. And this is where, again, we go into survival mode, right? This is where, you know, the, the, the reactivity and the instinct take over. And it's very automatic and there's very little intention involved. There's very little conscious awareness involved with it. It's very much the go-to when things are going wrong. 
Okay. So the the thing is that again, it, when things are beautiful, we can think all we want about about uh, um, uh, curiosity and 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 gratitude. But when things get when the going gets tough, as they say, when push comes to shove, as they say, we're down there in that lower part of our brain. And whatever it is that is our habitual response or our habitual reaction, that's what's going to come out. And it's no, it does no good to just promise ourselves that we're not going to do it, right? It doesn't work like that. We have to make curiosity and gratitude the new go-to, right? We have to practice it enough that it becomes the automatic thing that we turn to when life is pushing us, when life is squeezing us and applying that pressure to us. And that's why. And now, of course, connected to this also, I mean, I say curiosity and gratitude because those truly are the ones that like, because if you're, if you're curious about things, right, if you're, if you're saying that, well, well, what can I learn from this? What, what is this here to show me right now? Well, then that's an inquisitive mind. And the opposite of an inquisitive mind is a judging mind and a categorizing mind. Right. And, and, and when we're in that lower part of our brain, it is mostly judgment and categorization that we're going to get into because that is our survival. Right. Our brain wants to say, OK, that's bad. Stay away from it. Our brain is wants to say, OK, that's dangerous. That goes into the, the dangerous category. Right. Let's let's stay away from that. Right. But a lot of times that might not really be appropriate. If it's, you know, again, like a, co- a co-worker, you know, having a, a, a rough day and expressing a, a, a bitterness or, or, a, or, a, or a shortness of temper, right? That's not really dangerous for me. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm assuming that my, my co-worker isn't going to pick up a pair of scissors and attack me or something, right? That's usually not what happens, right? There's usually, you know, it's, it's just temper. It's just her, his or her emotions that are going on there. And so the curiosity then applies to how am I responding to this? Like, can I feel my own tension? Can I feel my own, you know, anger rising, right? Can I be curious about that? Where is this coming from? Why am I so angry about this? What is it that about this that's, that's triggering me right now? And as I get into that frame of mind or that mental state, I'm then in a non-judging awareness, which then leads me to acceptance and letting go of whatever I think should be happening. And this is how I stay in my center and grounded in my well-being, in my tolerance, in my patience. And as I was saying a few moments ago, I started to say anyway, that, that connected to this is kindness and compassion, right? And so I can tell you very, very clearly and very honestly and, and 100%, you know, surely that, that when, pe- when, when I experience things that are difficult, right? Like just this morning, I was at my, uh, my son's hockey practice and, and one of the coaches really laid into one of these kids. It wasn't my kid. I don't know how I, I don't, I hope that I would have still responded in the same way. That's why I do the practice. But, but when I saw this, I noticed myself getting really tense and really sort of angry and resentful. And I was at the point of saying like, well, you know, I got to contact the league. I got to tell them this isn't okay. Now, I could have just kept going with that. I could have just kept, you know, kind of let that cycle keep playing out. And, oh, man, this guy probably yells at everybody. There's probably just a matter of time before he strikes one of the kids. Or, you know, this is really a problem. I got to really, and and every time, all those thoughts and all the emotions and all the tension in my body is creating more and more and more of the same. And in that moment, it's, it's what the same as what I'm talking about is, you know, tension and stress and anger and, 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 you know, like fight or flight feeling, right? Like I'm, I'm feeling, I got to protect these kids. And so in that moment, as I'm experiencing that, instead of, you know, can, continuing to judge this coach and the whole situation, I can step back and say, wait a second though. Let me really try to understand this, 
right? How, how is, is what, you know, what is it that's happening in my body right now? What is it that's happening in my emotions? And where are the thoughts that I have about this coming from? Are they true? Or are they colored by my own experience? Am I, am I seeing like my parents yelling at me? Or is there some coach that yelled at me at some point in my life that's making me feel this way? What exactly am I worried about? Because just like a, a a colleague, you know, yelling at me for taking the yogurt out of the fridge or something, right? You know, this guy's not physically hurting any of the kids. And maybe the kids are okay with it, you know? And that's another thing is that when we when we practice this curiosity, we get to sort of disidentify from the situation, right? And then I realize that, wait a minute, these kids don't have the same trauma that I have as a ki- as w- from when I was a kid. So maybe being yelled at is not that big a deal for these kids because like, for instance, my son, I never yell at my son, never, ever, ever, ever. And so, so he's fine. Like to him, yeah, the coach is just upset. It's okay. It doesn't bother me. And that's what we talked about afterward, right? Because my curiosity kept me in that state of openness and, 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 you know, like this open awareness that allows for something to be true that I don't see (laughs) right away. It allows me to disidentify from my own experiences and look at it with curiosity and openness as opposed to judgment and categorization. I hope that makes sense to all of you. And I, and I hope you understand how important this really is. Because again, now, and, and going back to what I was saying with the orange or the neuroanatomy, whatever you want to, however you want to, you, however you choose to look at this, the reality is that, that, again, in those moments where you see the coach yelling at a kid, where you get caught off on the road, where you have a, a coworker raising their voice at you, in those moments is when we need this. But in those moments, the only thing we have access to is the automatic, habitual processing of our, of our survival brain. And so we have to make the survival brain curious. We have to make the survival brain um, uh, uh, grateful. Couldn't remember the word for whatever reason. Now, now this, you know, as I, as I said before, right, these various regions of the brain, right? You have the left and right division, you have the top-down division, right? Now, when, you know, as, as you all know, I, I talk about my mentor and my teacher and my, you know, just, I, I consider him a friend. He probably doesn't even remember who I am, but, but Dan Siegel, right? Um, author, neuroscientist, uh, psychiatrist, pediatrician, amazing dude, right? He talks so much about integration, right? And, and I'm sorry, I'm saying right all the time here, but, um, but, But integration means that all those various regions of the brain that I talked about, and of course, I'm simplifying this immensely, like unfairly simplifying it. But but the idea is, the general idea is to get all these different regions of the brain to, to be differentiated and then linked, okay? Which is to say that we don't want to diminish our survival brain. We need our survival brain. We don't want to you know, what we want to do is we want to integrate the survival brain with the, you know, executive brain, okay? And so the way we do that is not by, you see, and, and again, it can be like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. And this is really, I think, what the, the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is all about, is that we do have these two completely different brains in our head in a very real way. And in, and when things are calm, we're able to access things like kindness and compassion and, and, and understanding and curiosity and gratitude and all that stuff. But when things go bad, it's like our brain becomes disconnected, right? And we're all down there in that lower part. So as we practice curiosity, what we're also practicing is paying attention. Because when, we, when we're curious about something, we're attentive to it. We want to see it more. We want to draw ourselves into it. We want to, we wanna, you know, more information. Give me more here. Same thing with gratitude. It's an open and welcoming feeling. 
as opposed to things like anger and stress and anxiety, which then, you know, completely disintegrate the brain, right? There is no openness in, in anxiety and stress. It's all about, I got to label what's wrong so that I can survive it. So the idea then is as we, as we cultivate curiosity into that consciousness, and even we could call it the subconsciousness, that's when the, the top part of our brain and the bottom part of our brain start to work in, in harmony with each other, if you will. And that's the, the sort of first step into integration. And the reason I say that, and again, I'm, I'm really simplifying things. So don't, please don't take this to a, a, um, you know, a neuroscientist and try to tell him what's up or her what's up, because there's, it's a lot more complicated than I'm making it sound here, but I'm just for, you know, for conversation purpose, you know, kind of putting in real layman's terms here. Right. But as we develop that level of, of, um, integration, as Dan Siegel says, integration made visible is kindness and compassion, which is to say that when I am integrated in my brain and my nervous system and everything is working in a way that is differentiated, meaning that, that it's not weakened, it's, it's, it's working to its full potential and everything, but it's linked to every other part, then I'm naturally going to experience kindness and compassion. Which the reason why that's important, the reason I say this and how it's connected to, to curiosity and gratitude is that in that moment when I see the hockey coach yelling or I see somebody raising their voice at me or flipping the bird at me from a car or whatever it is, my automatic response, and I, it's not something where I have to say, Art, don't forget, you got to be compassionate, you got to be kind, you got to be curious, don't, you know, don't be don't forget, right? It's nothing like that. It's a complete automatic response, which, which the first thing I think of is, my gosh, what is this person going through that they feel they need to give me the middle finger from a car? They don't even know me. What is this hockey coach going through that he feels he needs to yell at this 12-year-old kid that way? And that changes everything. When I can meet that moment with that compassion and kindness and, and the curiosity and, and gratitude that, that helped me access that, well, then I, again, I am never in a place where I'm losing my sense of regulation. I'm never in a place where I'm, you know, completely hijacked by it. And therefore, my body doesn't experience stress. And when my body doesn't experience stress, it's not influencing the thoughts and the emotions, you know, into that more stressful and more reactive place. So throughout all your day, try to keep asking yourself that question every day. What can I be, what can I learn from this experience? And, and again, not just waiting for the difficult experiences because that's not how it works. You got to do it all the time so it becomes the automatic response, okay? So, so it's about, you know, when things are going really well, like what, what can I be curious about here? What can I, how can I meet this experience with curiosity and with gratitude for the opportunity of experiencing it? And then when the, the difficult moments come up and the life squeezes us and applies pressure to us, that is going to be available to you. If you have any questions about this, as you know, you can always contact me, okay? Art at artburnscoaching.com is my email address, and I will reply to every single email that comes into that address. And if I don't, it means that I didn't get the email. So send it again, okay? And of course, if you're on YouTube, you can leave a comment there. Um, the podcast doesn't allow for comments. I'm not sure why. I think that's something that <laughs> really should change here. <laughs> but um, but I'm not judging it. I'm not, not labeling. I'm just curious as to why they didn't think to do that. But anyway, um, I'm sure there's a reason. Um, and I'm grateful for the fact that I can ponder that. You see? It's that easy. <laughs> if you have any questions, let me know. Okay? All right, everybody. Well, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, I will try to be back in sooner than the next, like, three weeks or whatever it's been. But, uh, yeah, life should start uh, leveling out a little bit here uh, in the old Art Burns, Art Burns coaching worlds. Um, so we'll, we'll do our best. Okay? But thank you for your patience and thank you for your support. And, um 
And thanks for being there to listen to me. I really, really do appreciate you. All right, everybody. Wishing you well, and I'll be back again soon. Take care. <laughs>